Hi, this is Eric, and I was going to talk to you about one of the deadliest diseases on the face of the planet. This one won't get in any books. They probably won't make a movie uh, about this kind of outbreak, but diarrhea is one of the leading killers in the world, and, and kids less than five years old is the number one killer. So this is a big deal, and especially if you travel uh, to third world countries or overseas, then you uh, uh, you've probably experienced this either personally or known somebody, uh, and it can be a big deal. So what is it? Well, it's not very glamorous, but it's passing looser liquid stools more frequently than normal. It's kind of a vague uh, definition, uh, but what's published. Now, how does this work? Well, uh, we're going to focus on two, but there's four ways that this can work. I'll start with the first and last. One is osmotic shift, so that you have uh, a concentration of material inside the intestines, and that sucks fluid from the body into the intestinal lumen and then out the body. The other is a hypermotility syndrome uh, or hypermotility from drugs where the intestines just are a lot more um, mechanically active than what they would normally be. Now the two that we're going to focus on for the rest of the talk is an infection uh, that either destroys the mucosa, the, the lining of the intestines, uh, or uh, there's some kind of toxin mediated response that turns on the normal secretory mechanisms inside the intestines, so you start pouring water into the lumen of the intestines. Now, there can be bacterial causes and there can be viral causes, but we'll talk about bacterial causes first. Some examples of secretory diarrhea, again, this is where a toxin from the bacteria turn on the body's mechanisms, um, allowing water to move from the body into the intestines. Uh, so a form of E. coli can do it, Vibrio cholera, which is kind of the, what people normally know as cholera, uh, can do this. Uh, bacteria that invade the wall of the mucosa and actually damage it uh, and can cause some bleeding and bloody diarrhea. This is also known as dysentery. Uh, a different form of E. coli can do that. Shigella, Vibrio, Salmonella, Clostridium, Yersinia. Uh, Yersinia. All these different things can uh, invade and destroy the mucosa. Uh, other bacteria that can cause diarrhea are things like Campylobacter, Bacillus, Listeria, uh, all these things that you see you're listed. There's two that we'll talk about specifically later. One is Giardia and one is Entamoeba. Now, in the United States, where we've got intact infrastructure, we've got clean, potable water, and, and we don't have any raw sewage or anything like that, most of the cases of diarrhea inside the United States with intact uh, infrastructure are going to be viral. Uh, and of that, most of the viruses, uh, or most of the causes of viral diarrhea will go from norovirus, which is also called Norwalk. Uh, there's other viruses like rotavirus and the ones listed here. Um, so in Western countries, uh, with normal sewage systems and clean, reliable drinking water, um, viral causes can lead, uh, lead the pack. Now this kind of breaks down as you move into more dirty water. So how do we treat diarrhea? Well, the big mainstay is uh, counteracting the dehydration. This is what will kill people. Uh, so you can... Rehydrate them with an oral solution. Uh, you have to put in both water, sugar, and salt. And you can see here, if you take a liter of clean water, and you gotta make sure it's clean, you put in eight teaspoons of sugar and one teaspoon of salt, mix that up so that uh, all the sugar and salt are suspended. And you can use that to drink to uh, rehydrate. Now, there's a pump inside the intestinal wall which is requires energy in the form of ATP, and then it requires sodium and potassium. So in the solution, it, uh, it has the salt, the sugar, and the water, but it doesn't have the potassium. So to make this more effective, you may want to mash up some bananas or put in some orange juice into this so you supply the potassium to make this work a little bit better. Uh, give this rehydration uh, frequently until the person who's sick starts urinating uh, normal, clear urine at normal intervals. Now in kids, you can also give zinc supplements. Um, this has been known to decrease the amount of diarrhea and prevent death. So if you've got these small children with diarrhea, then I would definitely use zinc if you have access to it. And if they're greater than six months, you give 20 milligrams. If they're less than six months, you give 10 milligrams. Now you can use things like Imodium or Lomodal. Also, uh, Imodium is also Loperamide uh, to kind of slow down the intestines. So you slow down this motility. Uh, the key point here is that if you've got signs of dysentery, you know, the bloody diarrhea, the fever, do not give this. Also, if the kids are less than two years of age. And the reason why is that certain bacteria need to get out of the body. 
And if you slow this down, they're just going to sit inside the intestines and potentially cause more harm um, than just get flushing it out of the body. Now, if you, if you think it's a bacterial cause, uh, what can you do to treat it? Well, you can use ciprofloxacin or norfloxacin. These are called fluoroquinolone type antibiotics. And you can see the dosages there. Or one called azithromycin, which is a macrolide antibiotic. Uh, and the uh, adult and pediatric dose uh, are listed. Now, most of the bacterial causes that we talked about, this will treat. Uh, there are other treatments listed uh, in the past. Uh, trimethoven sulfamisoxazole, which is also known as Bactrim or Septra, uh, has been used, uh, as well as doxycycline, although those are no longer recommended because of the amount of resistance that's been developing worldwide. But uh, if you don't have access to the other drugs and you can't get hold of these, uh, then I would definitely consider them. The dose of uh, trimethoprin sulfamethoxazole is listed. You base it off of the amount of mil uh, milligrams of the trimethoprin and the adult and pediatric doses there. For doxycycline, uh, again, the adult and pediatric doses are listed. Now remember, to convert from pounds to kilograms, you divide pounds by 2.2, and that will give you the number of kilograms. Now, let's talk about these couple special situations. Amoebic dysentery. This is pretty common worldwide. Uh, again, if you spend time overseas, uh, you may have been exposed to this. It's caused by uh, Entamoeba histolytica, and the treatment for this is metronidazole. It's a different type of antibiotic, one that won't uh, work on E. coli and these other ones that were listed. Um, so this is a special situation. The adult and pediatric dose is listed. And Giardia, this is the most common GI pathogen worldwide. Uh, and you can be suspicious that you have Giardia because it can cause uh, a lot of uh, white, floating, foul-smelling stool. Um, this, this particular organism can also lead to some malnutrition because of fat malabsorption. Uh, and you treat this with a similar, uh, or with the same antibiotic listed right before with uh, metronidazole. A little bit different uh, strength, but same, um, same medication. You can also use one that was recently approved in the United States which is the uh, tineazole. So, what do you need to do? If you suspect non-viral causes, uh, then uh, I personally, uh, unless I can get a stool culture and know what I'm dealing with, I'm first going to try either ciprofloxacin, norfloxacin, or azithromycin for somewhere between three and five days. If this didn't fix the problem, and I'm still having diarrhea, then I would consider metronidazole. Uh, is a second line therapy. Now the caveat is if I'm thinking it might be Giardia straight out of the gate because of the, the white floating stools then I would start with metronidazole. Now something else that can cause uh, diarrhea is uh, whipworm infection uh, and you treat this with an anti-helminthic a, a deworming medication called mebendazole and a lot of times people actually see these small you know one to two centimeter worms inside the stool. Uh, if you, you do have a stool sample. Uh, they can be tested for uh, the eggs and worms and different types of uh, infections, so you know exactly what you're dealing with. But that's frequently not something that's accessible in some of these situations. So, not very glamorous, uh, but a disease that's very important, kills lots of people worldwide. Uh, and so if you're in a situation where you have a breakdown of the infrastructure, like the, the flooding that went in the uh, East Coast, uh, this year in 2010 where raw sewage is mixed with the, the, the rainwater and the runoff uh, so you now have breakdown of infrastructure so if you can't get potable water or if the water becomes contaminated you may be dealing with this um, again this is not a substitution for seeking uh, formal medical help uh, but again I've been in many situations where the people around me uh, had we not had a doctor available uh, they would have been very much on their own so just trying to arm people with information on how to approach uh, this particular topic. Now this kind of scratches the surface. There can be a lot more um, complications and nuances with this and a lot of different organisms, uh, but this will give you a, just a basic framework on where to get started. I uh, hope this helps and uh, thanks for watching.